Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to our weekly Outlook webinar. This is Ilya Yanyoto, founder of AllThingsForex.com and the host of the popular daily All Things Forex broadcast. Those of you who have never listened to the broadcast, make sure to visit AllThingsForex.com for one hour per day daily outlook of uh, the currency majors, major developments in the currency markets, trends, trade ideas, research, and education. All of that you can find on my website, allthingsforex.com. Make sure uh, while you're at it also to check out my book, The Quarters Theory, The Revolutionary New Foreign Currencies Trading Method, available everywhere books are sold, including on fx3.com. And speaking about fx3.com, I'd like to thank our friends there for hosting these series of weekly webinars. What I am here today is to prepare all of you for the trading week that's ahead of us. It's going to be a very busy trading week. And right off the bat, we're going to start with the main event of next week, the Bank of Japan's interest rate announcement. Two-day meeting on January 21st and 22nd is going to culminate with the announcement of the Bank of Japan's decision. Uh, much has been said and we have discussed in recent uh, months on this program the reasons and the factors behind the weakness of the Japanese yen, the massive sell-off uh, of the Japanese yen across the board, including versus the U.S. dollar. Uh, we now have seen uh, the 90 yen level being registered, a little bit above 90 yen for the intraday highs uh, for the dollar yen exchange rate. In other words, what the dollar yen currency pair has uh, been able to accomplish here in the last couple of months is to complete for, from the perspective of my quarter theory methodology. The dollar yen has managed to complete the entire 1,000 pip range between 80 and 90 yen. And that's quite impressive for a currency pair that was literally stuck within a range between roughly 75 and 80 yen. Uh, I would say pretty much for the majority of um, 2012, the last year. But uh, the big changes in uh, political landscape, new government, uh, new prime minister, uh, in Japan, really um, aggressive as far as uh, stimulating the economy, creating measures to weaken the Japanese yen, uh, spurring export growth, and so forth and so on. Uh, putting pressure on the Bank of Japan also to do more easing going forward, and uh, also uh, pressing the central bank to reconsider their 1% inflation target, which was established in February of 2012. Now, according to sources, quote, uh, familiar with uh, the thinking of the Bank of Japan um, in a report today by Reuters, um, they are reporting that the government uh, and the Bank of Japan have agreed to set a 2% inflation target as the new target for inflation next week. This is, by the way, something that the market has been pricing in. So that's not a surprise. It's not a shocking announcement. It's not a shocking report. Um, and more than likely, it seems to me uh, that the Bank of Japan is going to do that. In other words, the Bank of Japan is giving in to political pressure to do more easing and to move the inflation target from 1% to 2%. Also, uh, according to Reuters, citing sources of the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Japan will consider making an open-ended commitment to buy assets until the target is in sight. In other words... The Bank of Japan is going to do next Tuesday, uh, early Tuesday morning, late Monday night, because they don't normally announce the time of their uh, uh, decision announcement. It could be a little bit, uh, a couple of hours before midnight on Monday night. It could be midnight or after midnight on uh, Tuesday morning. Um, what the Bank of Japan seems to now, the direction that they're heading is exactly following the footsteps of the Federal Reserve. And that is committing to an open-ended quantitative easing. As Reuters says, they will more than likely consider making an open-ended commitment to buy assets until the inflation target is in sight. The bank will also discuss scrapping the interest that it pays on banks' reserves. This is, by the way, another effort that in recent years has been another tool that's been utilized by the central banks in order to 
stimulate uh, more um, lending in uh, the countries where these measures have been implementing, scrapping the interest that it pays on banks' reserves. <coughs> so um, it seems to me that a very, very similar type of monetary policies are being pursued by the Bank of Japan uh, when compared with uh, what the Federal Reserve is doing. And that is uh, another step forward towards a more aggressive type of monetary policy easing that we're more than likely going to witness with uh, the, the Bank of Japan's announcement next uh, week. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at the dollar-yen currency pair, which, uh, as I said, has managed to produce an incredibly strong bullish trend here in the last uh, few months. Uh, the high that I was referring to earlier this morning is uh, the 90.19 yen, a little bit of an overshoot there by 19 pips over the uh, major large quarter point at 90 yen, very important level as well, especially when it comes to the quarter theory methodology because it is a uh, dividing line, I call it a major whole number um, in a major large quarter point, a dividing line between between the two 1,000 pip ranges, the 80s and the 90s. The 1,000 pip range between 80 yen and 90 yen and the 1,000 pip range above, which is the 90 to 100 yen, 80s and the 90s. Will the underlying fundamental backdrop for the dollar and the Japanese yen and the global economy, the economy in the U.S. and in Japan and the global economy in general, justify that uh, there should be a transition from the 80s into the 90s. In other words, will the current fundamental backdrop justify a dollar-yen exchange rate above 90 yen? That is the question, and the answer to that question is what we're going to more than likely see uh, starting next week, depending on what the Bank of Japan decides. Obviously, if the Bank of Japan commits to open-ended quantitative easing, then that could mean further weakening of the Japanese yen, just as uh, we have witnessed recently. Although I would prefer, personally, to see a more significant price correction of this rally in this uh, bullish trend wave sequence that uh, the dollar-yen currency pair has given us here in the last couple of months. Uh, if we count the number of uh, trend waves, we have exactly four of them. And that, to me, is a little bit of an extended type of a trend wave sequence. Now, I want to give you uh, an example, ladies and gentlemen, here, because and I'm not trying to argue or challenge the Elliott wave theory here. Please do not misunderstand this. But this is the reason why, for the lack of the better, better word, in my book, The Quarters Theory, for a lack of a better name, I call it, my version of the classic Elliott wave theory and pattern, the quarters theory trend waves, because the main problem that I have had when I utilize the classic Elliott wave theory is the fact that there's many instances when the classic Elliott wave pattern is not what the market gives us. If you recall, the classic Elliott wave pattern will would give you three waves in the same direction. In other words, three waves that progress the trend. Those are waves number one, three, and five. Now, waves number two and, and, and four, many of you are familiar with that, are the, the actual, what I call, correction. See, with my quarter theory methodology and the quarter theory trend waves, I actually do not give a number to the corrective waves. In other words, I call them price corrections because it's easier to recognize which waves that way. To me, at least, it's easier to recognize which waves are the waves that are actually the trend waves that progress the trend, not regress it, not causing prices to pull back during periods of price correction. So that's one of the major differences. And the biggest difference between my version of the classic Elliott wave theory, and all credit due to Mr. Ralph Nelson Elliott for creating this, because obviously he was the person who, who saw that there is a uh, systematic uh, approach there, that there are patterns that, uh, that do occur, and that's very helpful as far as traders recognizing the stages of the trend's progression. 
and development. Uh, it is a, uh, a remarkable, remarkable tool. For those of you who have not ever utilized Elliott Waves, please do yourself a favor and, and do a little research and, and learn about them. Uh, in my classic, in my version of the classic Elliott Waves theory, uh, however, and that's the biggest difference, I do not limit the number of waves that can establish. Unlike the classic pattern where you have the waves number one, three, and five being the trend waves that progress the, the, the trend, I do not limit that number to three waves. As a matter of fact, in my book, The Quarters Theory, I actually give, give examples when we have seen seven consecutive bullish waves, and bearish waves, by the way, following each other. Seven, not three. Seven. So this is the example recently that we've witnessed with the dollar-yen currency. And I'm showing you the daily chart of the dollar-yen. Where we're now seeing not the classic three waves. If for a wa Elliott wave trader, just to give an example, Elliott wave trader would, let's say, count these waves and go, one, there's a correction here, two, there's a correction following the second wave, the third wave, and that's where they would say, okay, now we're ready for the price correction. So now we're, wait, we're ready for wave A, B, and C, which is obviously the corrective type of a pattern. Well, that what, that's what happens when you limit the number of waves. Only to find out that the third bullish wave was not followed by wave a, B, and C, the corrective waves, but rather by a fourth consecutive bullish trend wave. And guess what? If this, is, if this trend remains very, very strong, this fourth bullish wave might even be followed by a fifth one. As I mentioned earlier in my book, I show examples where we have seven waves following each other. So just a quick little um, educational uh, content, if you will, at the start of this uh, weekly Outlook webinar that perhaps will um, help traders realize, I hope, will help traders realize which stage of the trend progression uh, they consider getting involved in, simply because it's always best to get into the early stages of the trend development rather than in the latter stages. Uh, and now I'm not saying that the fourth wave will be the final one, but of course if we go with five or seven waves going forward, we could easily see the dollar continuing the rally versus the Japanese yen. However, considering the fact that this is now a fourth consecutive bullish wave and we've already um, approached a very important psychological level to many traders, to me and my quarter theory, a very important junction between the two 1,000 pip ranges. I think that uh, we should be cautious when we consider further continuation of this bullish trend. And don't get me wrong, I'm not calling the end of this, uh, this trend. This could turn out to be, as I've been calling for it, for a number of months, this could turn out to be a much longer uh, type of a trend, not just for the last couple of months. It could be a trend that lasts uh, a year, maybe even two. But you have to realize that no trend keeps going up, 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 up. There's going to be more significant price corrections that are healthy. And that's what I'm trying to warn about here. That although the trend is strong and it could continue further, we should consider several factors. Uh, overextended uh, conditions of this trend wave progression, that's a red flag. Um, a lot of indicators have been showing a lot of traders, and I don't personally follow um, any of these stochastics or relative strength index uh, indicators that show you overbought, oversold conditions. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they're bad. I think that one should pay attention to them if they like to. But it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to <laughs> really determine that uh, the yen has been oversold. I mean, you don't need a relative strength or index or a stochastic to show you 
that uh, these, uh, this is a currency pair in oversold or overbought conditions for the dollar oversold conditions for the yen. All you have to do is take a look at the number of pips that uh, the dollar has been able to um, gain versus the Japanese yen, and there are now over 1,100 pips. And the fact that we have not had any significant price correction since that latest four bullish trend wave sequence uh, began, which was around, uh, let's see here, around the baseline there, around 81 and a half, 81.67 uh, area. And uh, that should tell you right there that conditions are uh, oversold for the Japanese yen. And um, also, we need to consider the 90 yen level, which is could become an important resistance area, especially if the market finds out that uh, there is no fundamental justification for a transition of the dollar yen's exchange rate into the 90s. Although, um, as I mentioned earlier, if the Bank of Japan do give us the 2% inflation target, which has been priced in, but I don't think that the market's priced in open-ended quantitative easing, which is uh, QE forever, as some have named it here in the U.S. that the Fed gave us. Well, if the Bank of Japan does QE forever now as well, I think that could give further impetus to Japanese yen selling. And, of course, if Japanese economic data later in the week, we have the trade bonds report, and going forward continues to uh, show signs of weakness in the Japanese economy, that means that... Uh, QE forever is just simply going to continue. And by the way, we also have next week the Consumer Price Index from Japan, which is the main measure of inflation preferred by the Bank of Japan. And uh, that report is not uh, expected to change the market's expectations that that QE forever uh, could continue. Because if now the 2% target is the level that the Bank of Japan tells us next week, um, until that level is reached, they're not going to stop doing quantitative easing. Well, guess what? The consumer price index, the inflation gauge in Japan is very, very far from the 2% level. It actually is below zero. The national core consumer price index uh, last month was at minus 0.1%, below zero year over year. And next Thursday, at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time next Thursday, another important report from Japan is going to bring us the Consumer Price Index report. Again, the National Core Consumer Price Index is expected to be at minus 0.2% year over year. In other words, heading deeper below zero in deflation territory, rather than getting closer to the 2% desired inflation target. So that's what I'm saying is <laughs> when we talk about these inflation goals and targets by the Bank of Japan, if that's, if the Reuters report this morning is accurate, then we could have, literally have QE forever in Japan. And that's not going to be a Japanese yen positive. And if investor sentiment, that which is crucial also for this trend to continue, investor sentiment must remain positive. Otherwise, obviously massive risk aversion could cause flight uh, into the Japanese yen, which is, believe it or not, still perceived as a safe haven currency. I actually, six months ago in my program, the All Things Forex uh, broadcast, asked the rhetorical question, how is the Japanese yen st still considered as a safe haven currency? And we have been discussing all of the factors. I've actually been a Japanese yen bearer since the beginning of 2011, but I thought, I, I think uh, the the timing was a little bit too early for that. It, it started, uh, the uh, shifts uh, began in, uh, in February of 2012. But it took almost a whole year for us to start seeing the reversals. And uh, this is what we're witnessing now, and that's why I'm saying this, this is a trend and a shift after, uh, what what is it, like six or seven years of, of um, strong bullish Japanese yen trend versus the dollar finally we're starting to see some signs of reversal. That's why I think this trend could continue longer. And ultimately the dollar yen could transition and evolve 90 yen. But before that I would like to see 
a more significant price correction, and that's why we should. And and by more significant price correction, I don't mean uh, the correction we saw recently, the couple of corrections of a hundred or so pips. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about a more significant price correction of the dollar's gains since November, which the dollar found support a little bit above 79 yen level, and now has rallied to a little bit above 90 yen. That's the over the over 1,100 pips actually. Uh, of gains that the dollars registered, up to 50% on a larger price correction, up to 50, the so-called perfect 50% of natural retracement of 1,100 pips. We're talking about 550 pips of a more significant price correction. In other words, a move down towards the 85 yen area or uh, previous uh, high for 2012, which was 84.17 level. That's a more significant price correction that I would like to see before this uh, bullish trend uh, resumes. And it will tell us uh, a great deal uh, as far as whether this trend is actually strong enough to continue uh, going forward. If it's able to, if the dollar is able to regain its strength after a healthy uh, significant price correction. So we'll watch what happens after this fourth bullish wave. As I said earlier, in my book, I give you examples of seven waves, so we should not limit the number of waves, especially when you have strong trends. <clears throat> you can have those extended trend wave sequences of more than three, three consecutive waves in the same direction progressing the trend. Uh, so this could continue further, but on the other hand, be also aware that overextended trend wave uh, uh, sequences can be followed at any time by a more significant price correction. Now, let's talk about what if the Reuters report today is wrong? What if the Bank of Japan does not do what Reuters says, citing sources of the Bank of Japan? What if the Bank of Japan does not give us what Reuters is reporting today? And what the market's been, by the way, pricing in in recent uh, months? Well, that would be a disappointment, obviously, but that also could serve a, as a catalyst for that more significant price correction to start. If the Bank of Japan does not promise QE forever next week, if the Bank of Japan says, okay, we'll still consider raising the uh, inflation target from 1% to 2%, um, but we are not going to do it now, then obviously we should be prepared for that serving as a buy on a rumor, sell on a fact, actual type of uh, an announcement, which, by the way, is also something that we should uh, be mindful of. It, what if the market's already priced in such expectations? I don't think QE forever is being priced in. That's why, as I said earlier, we could see further extension of the, the yen sell-off. But... For the most part, I think the 2% target is being priced in. And if we get to see buy on the rumor, sell on the fact in the aftermath of uh, the Bank of Japan's announcement, the yen actually gets to strengthen, then that's also something that we should be aware of. And what a better um, price level for a more significant price correction to start at? than the 90 yen level. After all, as I said earlier, the dollar yen has completed the entire 1,000 pip range between 80 and 90 yen. Um, a lot has been accomplished. We have overextended, uh, oversold conditions for the yen, overextended trend. Well, it's not overextended yet, but it is an extended trend wave sequence and so forth and so on, the factors I mentioned earlier. Now, uh, enough about the dollar yen. Let's continue forward with the top 10 events for next week. Um, series of economic data next week coming from the U.S., the Eurozone, and also the United Kingdom is going to also keep the spotlight on the Euro and the British pound, um, not just on the Japanese yen. And what we're, we really want to see next week when it comes to the Euro especially, after this uh, optimism rally, uh, remember last week, last Thursday after the, bank, uh, the European Central Bank's announcement, the President Mario Draghi came out very optimistic about recovery starting to kick in in later 2013, um, saying that uh, the economy is gradually going to recover in late 2013.
there were several politicians from the European Union that came out and officially declared the debt crisis over, which uh, <laughs> what, that's, uh, that's just another one of those cyclical uh, the crisis is over announcement because I think even a couple of years ago we had some politicians from Italy coming out and saying that the crisis was officially over, which uh, was far from true as <laughs> that the history showed us. So is the debt crisis over? Well, things have definitely gotten better, but I can't really claim the end of the crisis at this point. Um, I think that uh, there's still a lot of unknowns when it comes to what's going on in uh, the Eurozone, especially uh, with the Italian election coming up. Later on in the year, we have the German election. Uh, is uh, Spain going to need additional funding? Um, quite possibly, not right now, but later on down the road, uh, Portugal. And by the way, we had the Portuguese president saying earlier this week that uh, um, conditions are becoming, uh, quote, uh, socially unsustainable, uh, the situation in Portugal. There is uh, fiscal austerity, obviously, in a debt-ridden nation, is leading, he said, uh, to declining output and lower tax revenue. And he said, we must stop this vicious cycle. This is not just in Portugal. This is in Greece and a lot of the other uh, countries there that uh, asked for bailouts. And this is, by the way, what's happening in Spain. And that's a major drag on all of these economies. It's also a drag on the Eurozone economy in, in general. And uh, earlier this week on Tuesday, Speaking about drag of, on the economy, we saw the German GDP for the fourth quarter disappointing with a uh, unexpected decline by 0.5 percent quarter over quarter in the fourth quarter of 2012. It uh, led me to ask the question, who is going to bail out the entire eurozone now uh, when it comes to economic growth? Because if you recall, in the first quarter of 2012, it was the German stronger than expected German GDP numbers that bailed out the rest of the Eurozone GDP data because of the stronger growth in, in Germany. That lifted the overall GDP numbers in the Eurozone to show flat 0% growth. I mean, it still didn't show any growth in the entire Eurozone quarter over quarter, but at least we didn't see the contraction. So in the first quarter of 2012, at least Germany helped the overall GDP numbers, but that was not the case in the second quarter and the third quarter of 2012. We did, as I've been forecasting, indeed see the uh, contraction in the second and the third quarter in the Eurozone, which is two consecutive quarters of contraction. That's the definition of a recession. It was a double dip recession in the Euro area. And I would not be surprised, especially after the, the disappointing German GDP numbers for the fourth quarter, I would not be surprised come February when the GDP estimates for the fourth quarter uh, in the Euro area come out. I would not be surprised if the, the GDP numbers, again, are uh, below uh, in contraction territory, showing uh, minus readings rather than showing uh, an expansion. And so if we see the fourth quarter GDP numbers in the euro area coming in February being uh, showing another quarter of contraction, that will be three consecutive quarters of contraction, quite similar to what we saw with uh, the double dip recession in the U.K., the double depreciation in the UK lasted for three consecutive quarters of contraction. And I would not be surprised if that's what we see with the euro area, with the fourth quarter GDP numbers. So why is that important? Well, it's important because if the eurozone growth remains nowhere to be seen, then despite of the optimistic outlook by the European Central Bank, which, by the way, has helped the euro um, in the uh, last week or so, and investor sentiment in general, despite of that, if the data continues to scream recession, then once the market finally gets over this uh, euphoria <laughs> and optimism rally and look at closer to underlying conditions and find out that growth is still nowhere to be seen in the euro area, then that could weigh on the euro and expectations that there may be more easing whether the European Central Bank wants to do it or not. And uh, today there is even speculation that the European Central Bank could seek uh, to slow down the rising short-term interest rates in the region. 
which have been rising here in the last week because of the optimism rally. So um, there's still plenty of issues there for us to declare the crisis over, especially when it comes to growth. That's going to be a big, big challenge for the euro area. And that is why it's so important next week and in the weeks ahead and months ahead to pay close attention to all of the economic data from the eurozone. And the ZW economic sentiment index is due next Tuesday. And uh, we're expecting to see some significant improvement in the outlook. This is a leading indicator, obviously, of uh, economic conditions there. In Germany, the largest economy in the Eurozone and uh, also from the Euro area in general. But both of the um, economic sentiment indexes from Germany and the Eurozone are expected to show significant improvement. 12.2 reading in uh, uh, January for the German one and 14.1 for the Euro area. That's compared with 7.6 in the previous month. So, it could be a uh, good report, optimistic report there. And that's why I said earlier, if the Eurozone data starts improving, if it continues to show us signs of weakness, then obviously that could weigh on the Euro. But if it starts improving in line with the market's optimistic outlook and the European Central Bank's optimistic outlook, that could uh, renew uh, the strengthening of um, the euro that we witnessed uh, this week versus the U.S. dollar and other currency measures. Let's uh, quickly take a look at the daily chart of the euro-dollar pair. We have a breakout that we discussed. Was it last Friday that we discussed this breakout above the top of the previous range, above the previous resistance at the dollar $33.07? We had a move to, uh, earlier this week to dollar $34.03. Now it seems like dollar and 34 cents level is serving as an area of resistance, um, and the euro has been having some problems in the last couple of days overcoming that resistance. Today is being put under pressure again; it's falling below dollar and 33 cents level, perhaps back to the preceding large quarter point, which is dollar 32.50. I don't think that uh, if you follow my quarter theory methodology, I don't think that uh, the law that you saw earlier this week at the dollar thirty-two fifty-two was in it, or fifty-five. I don't think that you would consider that as a coincidence. Obviously, it's a move back to the preceding large quarter point, dollar thirty-two fifty, after the euro unsuccessfully completed the quarter towards the dollar thirty-five cents and then reached dollar thirty-five and, and encountered significant resistance at the whole number at the dollar thirty-four cents, which is an important flow in my quarters theory within the large quarters because. It could be the last problematic price point, as I explained in my book, that prevents the completion of a large quarter, that being the whole number preceding a large quarter point. So dollar thirty four is exactly that. It's a whole number preceding the large quarter point to the dollar and thirty five cents. And here we have it, we have the resistance there, dollar thirty four, and as as a result of the unsuccessful completion of the quarter between dollar thirty two fifty and the dollar thirty five cents. What happens in most instances, even in the new normal environment, it still happens in most instances. And by the new normal environment, I refer to <laughs> the environment where economic data does not matter. What matters is what central banks do and what politicians or central bankers say. But even in a new normal environment, uh, we still can see these uh, premises and methodologies of my course theory playing out. So as a result of unsuccessful completion of a large quarter, as I say in my book, The Quarter Theory, uh, we can anticipate the reversal that takes prices back to the preceding large quarter point. And in this case, the move was a bullish move above dollar thirty-two fifty, a break above dollar thirty-three oh seven, um, moving into the quarter between dollar thirty-two fifty towards dollar thirty-five cents, encountering resistance of dollar thirty-four, the whole number preceding the large quarter point, dollar thirty-five cents. Uh, failure to overcome break above that level leads to reversal that takes prices back to dollar thirty-two fifty. It was the law on January sixteenth at dollar thirty-two fifty-five. Once again, dollar thirty-two fifty is this guy, as I explained many times on this program. 
you're not going to see in most instances the actual large quarter point being registered exactly after the pip. You're going to see a number that's within a few pips ahead of that uh, large quarter point or surpassing it by a few pips. It's practically impossible for a $4 trillion a day uh, volume market for prices to stop exactly at an exact level. So don't be shocked if you do not get to see $1.3250 being, or any other large quarter point being registered there exactly after the pip. But as long as the numbers are within at least 25 pips, or as I call it, one small quarter from a targeted large quarter point, we consider that large quarter point reached and the quarter completed, or a reversal towards the pre previous large quarter point completed as well. So anyway, um, this is where the dollar pulled back, uh, the euro pulled back to dollar thirty-two fifty. Uh, then it uh, moved up to again uh, the top of this, what could now establish itself as a range, and that's why I'm moving these uh, lines here. This is the area that you should watch. It's about a hundred and fifty pip area between $1.3250 and $1.34. This is where the euro dollar exchange rate has been fluctuating within for the entire week. And uh, obviously next week the euro is going to need a catalyst for a breakout, either above the top of this range of the $1.34 or below the bottom of it. And depending on where the breakout occurs, then we can get an idea as far as a more definite trend direction for the euro dollar pair. But for the time being, for the last several trading sessions, the euro is trendless. And it is making an attempt today uh, to produce another bullish wave on this daily chart to break above that resistance uh, at the dollar thirty four cents. But the high today was dollar thirty three ninety seven. So guess what? The breakout did not occur today. And that's not a, necessarily a sign of strength. And this is why. Uh, we could see the euro testing again the bottom of, uh, of this range at the dollar thirty two fifty and a break below this level could take the euro to dollar thirty one fifty seven which was the previous bottom of another weekly range and uh, the support level below dollar thirty two fifty for the euro dollar pair it 's also an area of uh, some resistances here two identical highs that were reached at the dollar thirty one thirty eight and a dollar thirty one twenty five this is another area that you should watch it 's a little bit below dollar thirty one fifty but uh, could be an important area of support that's challenged if next week the euro breaks below the large quarter point at dollar thirty two fifty um, in other words, if investor sentiment deteriorates if there's more news that the European Central Bank could consider uh, ways to reduce these uh, short term interest rates the increase there. If there's uh, uh, more economic data from the Eurozone that doesn't instill much confidence in, uh, in growth creation there, although the ZW index, as I said earlier, is expected to be uh, more upbeat, and later on in the week we have the IFO index next Friday, another one of our top ten events, which is also expected to be a little bit stronger. Uh, previous reading for the German IFO business climate index was 102.4. The forecast is for a reading of 103.1, so it should be interesting to see whether these indexes are able to instill some confidence in the state of the Eurozone um, economy. Also, on Thursday, from the Euro area, we have the Purchasing Managers Index uh, from the services and from the manufacturing sectors. Uh, both of them are expected to show slight improvement. 48.1 reading for the services uh, index, 46.6 for manufacturing. This is a little bit higher than 47.8 and a little bit higher than 46.1. But even at 48.1 and 46.6, both of these indexes um, are still below 50, which is in contraction territory. And that will be yet another month. Uh, I think that there's about a year, year and a half now, almost, that uh, the Eurozone Purchasing Managers Indexes have been in contraction territory. And that's one of those <laughs> reports that I've been citing all along for months, that uh, they're leading indicators of future economic conditions, and it doesn't seem to me that conditions are improving that much in 
both of these sectors, manufacturing and services. They're a little bit better than they were a few months ago, but they're still both expected to be below 50, which is in contraction territory. So that's the sequence of Eurozone economic data uh, next week. And if the data doesn't instill much confidence in investors' uh, sentiment deteriorates, we get to see more risk aversion next week. That could be the catalyst for the euro to break lower uh, below the bottom of this range. Don't forget also that uh, next week is going to be the type of a week also that uh, could put the dollar in focus, um, especially because of the upcoming uh, Federal Reserve interest rate announcement, which is due on the 30th of January, the Wednesday after next Wednesday, which is something that we will talk about in our webinar outlook on Friday. But don't be surprised if the dollar is being uh, put under pressure in the week ahead, in a week leading to um, the uh, Federal Reserve's announcement, which is due on Wednesday, January the 30th. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Especially if uh, there's more uh, optimism, if uh, the data from the U.S., which has been positive throughout this week, also instilling confidence in the state of the U.S. economy. We had better housing starts yesterday. We had a uh, significant decline in the jobless claims, so four-year um, to the best level for housing starts since 2008. And uh, next week, uh, we also have a sequence of important U.S. economic data, which is going to start on Tuesday with the existing home sales, which is the main measure of uh, housing market conditions. The existing home sales are expected to be stronger uh, 5.04 million was the report, was the number in December, the, uh, actually in November, the the uh, December number is expected to be even higher, 5.11 million existing home sales. And the housing market, that has been in line with the improvement in the labor market uh, in the U.S. that we've seen in recent months. So housing has been showing signs of uh, improvement as well. And uh, the existing home sales are expected to be in line with uh, that improvement. Then on Friday, that's the last of the top ten events, Next week, we'll see the U.S. new home sales, which um, are also expected to be in line with that trend. That 383,000 uh, new home sales uh, for the month of December compared with 377,000 for the month of uh, uh, for the month of uh, November. So um, we could see uh, another sequence of positive U.S. economic data from. The housing market, that could help uh, investor sentiment and could keep risk appetite going next week. Um, also next week, we're going to keep an eye on the British pound, which is being put under pressure in uh, recent trading sessions. But I think that might actually present an opportunity, especially if we don't get to see later next week on Friday. The uh, GDP numbers uh, showing uh, the UK economy contracting again. And I'll elaborate on that in just a minute. But uh, before we get to, to the GDP report from the UK, we will pay close attention to jobless claims and an employment rate measure uh, on Wednesday uh, from the UK. Which, by the way, is coming up at 4.30 a.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, along with the Bank of, uh, Bank of England's meeting minutes from the previous meeting, um, at which the Bank of England did nothing. They kept the rate at the record low level, half a percent, and uh, also did not expand the size of their quantitative easing program, the asset purchase program. And if that's what the meeting minutes uh, reveals, so the Bank of England is not in any hurry, to do more quantitative easing, I think that ultimately could help the British pound going forward, especially as I've been writing in recent weeks and months, the pound could look as a, as a more viable, better alternative to uh, currencies whose central banks are um, going all in with quantitative easing. In other words, uh, those are the central banks that, like the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan probably, if they announce QE forever, uh, or their version of QE forever next uh, week. 
And so that's why I'm saying the pound, despite of this uh, decline, which is uh, declining because the economic data from the UK has not been instilling much confidence in the recovery there. There's been already some calls that there might be a triple depreciation in the UK. But if these expectations are disproved, and the Bank of England continues to sit on the QE sidelines, then the pound would look uh, as, a, as a good alternative to, let's say, the dollar or the Japanese yen, whose central banks are all in with quantitative easing. And maybe even as a better alternative to, well, I don't know, that might be a little bit of a stretch, but to the euro as well. If, if that's what we see with, from the UK, uh, provided there's no disappointment. So uh, the jobless claims in the UK are expected to increase by only 800, according to consensus forecasts, after declining by 3,000 in the previous month. So that might not be that bad of a report on Wednesday. Unemployment rate, however, is expected to inch a little bit higher to 7.9% in the UK from 7.8% in the previous month. And then on Friday, we will see the GDP report from the UK uh, which, by the way, is expected to show the economy contracting by 0.2% in the fourth quarter after rising, uh, after growing by 0.9% for over quarter in the third quarter. What does that mean? Well, it means that the fears of a triple dip recession are already not only emerging, but they might be proof if the GDP numbers uh, do indeed come out uh, negative next Friday morning. And that's going to, such expectations, of course, are going away on the bridge bank. What uh, a GDP drop by 0.2% in the fourth quarter means is that after briefly returning back to growth in a, fourth, in a third quarter of 2012, after three consecutive quarters of contraction, in the fourth quarter of 2011, the first quarter of 2012, and the second quarter of 2012, the UK economy contracted for three consecutive quarters. That was a double dip recession. By the way, the first double dip recession in the United Kingdom economy in 30 years. Now, there is a potential, according to the consensus forecasts, for the UK economy to contract again after briefly returning to growth in the fourth quarter contracting again by 0.2% quarter over quarter in the fourth quarter of 2012. That is not something that would keep the pound supported. As a matter of fact, it would raise the odds that the Bank of England, whether they like it or not, may be forced into doing more quantitative easing, into expanding their, the size of their asset purchase program, or resorting to other creative measures to... Um, ease monetary policy further. And that is not going to be a British pound positive. This is why we shouldn't be surprised when we see the pound being put under pressure on a trading session like today and uh, breaking below the support level that uh, was the area around uh, dollar and 60 cents, uh, breaking above uh, last week's low, which was this low right there at the dollar 59.91, and now extending its losses to an intraday low at $1.5856, which is very near to approach the bottom of this uh, multi-month range that the pound-dollar exchange rate has been fluctuating within uh, for the last, uh, oh, how many months? Four or five months since September or August of last year? $1.5822 uh, is the price level that is serving as the bottom of this range. And we are only about 30 pips away from testing that level. And if the GDP numbers are not uh, positive next week, next Friday, that could serve as a catalyst for the pound to uh, break even lower, below the bottom of this range, which uh, shortly below that level, of course, uh, below $1.58.22, uh, is $1.57.52, uh, which is not only a support level from August of last uh, summer, but also it is uh, within five pips or two pips from the large quarter point of the dollar fifty-seven fifty. So again, I think you, you could see there 
it was not really a coincidence that dollar fifty-seven and a half is going to be a level there that would be uh, more than likely challenged if the pound uh, sees further weakness next week. So it should be interesting to see uh, the GDP numbers from the UK. And I'm suspecting that uh, if these consensus forecasts are accurate, we could see, and if investor sentiment deteriorates, we could see the pound actually breaking below this, uh, the bottom of this range, below dollar 58.2. But shortly below that, you'll have a number of support levels, dollar 57, uh, what was it, oh, right over here, dollar 57, 66, and 75, and there were uh, several levels of uh, resistance there. You can see this area that's been tested multiple times for a few months. Dollar fifty seven seventy six, dollar fifty seven uh sixty six. That's the area around dollar fifty seven fifty large quarter point. That was a previous level of resistance on the way down. Uh, it could be an important area of support uh, that the pound could find at uh, around this level. If if that area is taken out then obviously the pound could head lower to dollar and fifty five cents and maybe even to dollar fifty two and a half if um, the market continues to price in more easing by the u k central bank as I said earlier the, the pound's been looking like a, a viable alternative to the currencies whose central banks have been doing more aggressive quantitative easing. But if uh, these uh, expectations uh, that the Bank of England will sit on the sidelines change and the market starts pricing in more easing by the Bank of England, then that uh, could put the pound under additional pressure. All right. Well, that seems to be all the time that we have for today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we finish, uh, I would like to invite you to listen to my daily outlook and uh, broadcast uh, on allthingsforex.com, the so-called All Things Forex daily broadcast. You can find it on uh, my website, allthingsforex.com, for the latest updates uh, in All Things Forex. You can follow us on Twitter, at All Things Forex is the Twitter account. Thank you so much for uh, attending the webinar today. Uh, have a great day and a great weekend, and I will see you again next Friday, January the 25th.